Okay, so we are going to be talking about types of pesticides, pesticide toxicity and impacts, the pesticide label, uh, less toxic pesticides, and information resources on pesticides. So it's the general topics we're going to talk about today. What are pesticides? Uh, pesticides and their defined in law are substances that control, suppress, prevent, or repel pests. And then pesticides are used against all different kinds of pests. Uh, a lot of times people, some people seem to think that pesticide is a term that refers <laughs> only to insecticides, but pesticide re refers to the whole, uh, a broad range of types of products that kill or uh, uh, suppress different types of pests. So herbicides suppress weeds, insecticides, kill insects, rodenticides kill various types of rodents, fungicides uh, kill fungi, then there's also bacteria sides for some of the bacterial uh, plant pathogens, acaricides or miticides <laughs> against mites, and molluscicides against slugs and snails. So these are all pesticides. Some people say, well, it's a herbicide, it's not a pesticide. No, a herbicide is a type of a pesticide. And one of the important things to know about a pesticide when you're using it is what its selectivity is. Um, and it can help you choose what pesticide to use and help you determine uh, how, uh, uh, how it might impact the environment. So a broad spectrum pesticide kills a wide range of organisms. So you have a product like this bifenthrin insecticide here, uh, Ortho-Max. It kills all kinds of stuff. It kills all types of insects, including ants, grubs, aphids, caterpillars. And it also kills bees, and it kills, kills fish, and various other kinds of non-targets. So it's very broad. It's the type of insecticide people really used to like to have in their garage, because, you know, it killed everything. And, um, but the problem with those kinds of pesticides is it's also killing our beneficials and our bees. So uh, we try to avoid using broad spectrum pesticides when po possible. The ideal pesticide in an integrated pest management pesticide is a selective insecticide um, because they only kill organisms in a special group and in, uh, in a special group. So. The Bacillus thuringiensis, Kerstaki, uh, is this uh, Bt pesticide, uh, and it only kills caterpillars uh, that feed on leaves that are actually treated with it. Uh, so as a result, it's not going to impact beneficials or bees or your dog or your kid or fish. And so it's a it's a benign type of product, and it's very selective. Of course, if caterpillars aren't your problem, if uh, termites or earwigs are your problem, B BT is not going to be at all effective. Yes? What about butterfly caterpillars? Yeah, that's a, but it's a good question to ask because you, you get a lot of questions about this with, uh, with the use of uh, BT, the cellstone jensen. Of course, uh, the immatures of butterflies are caterpillars, and so they are susceptible to BT. Um, so what you want to be careful is not to treat plants that, of course, some of these butterfly caterpillars, you know, like the uh, imported cabbage worm, which is, you know, feeding on your cabbages, you want to manage that because you don't want to hold your cabbage, right? Um, but uh, what you don't want to do is uh, treat those plants that you're growing in your butter butterfly garden. <laughs> because most of the butterfly, butterflies that are the really attractive, beautiful butterflies, like monarchs and things that people are really concerned about, they have very specialized um, foods, usually some kind of weed <laughs> or unusual plant, like milkweed for monarchs, for instance. Um, and those won't be impacted by BT that's applied on your tomatoes or on your cabbage because those caterpillars are not feeding on your tomatoes or your cabbage. But don't just don't treat your, your milkweed plants with it or other plants that you know uh, support the butterflies that you want to have. 
because the caterpillar has to take it into its gut and ingest it. Uh, so with the herbicide selectivity is also an issue. It's a little bit uh, different here in a way. Um, uh, so we have uh, selective herbicides that kill grasses but not broadleaves. So these are ones you might use in your planting beds. And then there's selective herbicides that kill broadleaf plants but not grasses. Those are used in lawns. So they're selective for major groups of uh, weeds or plants. And then there's non-selective herbicides. The most uh, commonly used material in gardens is glyphosate, Roundup, but lots of other tra trade names now for uh, Roundup because it will kill or injure almost every kind of a plant if it gets on it. So it is not selected, it's non-selective. Glyphosate is non-selective because it will uh, injure all kinds of plants, but these other ones are used in specific situations. Uh, another thing about uh, herbicides that uh, is important to know if you're using them is there are pre-emergent herbicides and post-emergent herbicides. Pre-emergent herbicides uh, kill weeds just as they're germinating. Um, and so you apply them before they germinate. And post-emergent uh, herbicides are, need to be applied on the, the leaves of growing herbicide, growing weeds. So um, they are post-emergent. So um, if you apply uh, a pre-emergent herbicide after the plants have already, the weeds have already started growing, then it's too late for them. And then for post-emergent herbicides, <coughs> you apply after the green leaves start peeking up out of the soil. Uh, these can be divided into contact herbicides and systemic herbicides. So a contact herbicide is one that um, only injures or kills the part of the plant that comes in contact with the herbicide. So here we have the herbicide being applied on the leaves, and it kills the leaves. But what do you know, the roots survived, and uh, you know, a few weeks later, a new plant grew out of that root. So they will burn back plants, but if you have larger plants with more sturdy roots, um, they uh, often the plant will regrow. So the contact herbicides, uh, a lot of the organic herbicides you see on the market, that's what they are, is, is contact ones that just really burn them back. They might be good for little seedlings and the cracks and crevices of your sidewalk or something, but they, are, uh, they, they don't kill a larger plants back. Most of the more, the, the uh, synthetic herbicides are actually systemic herbicides, and these you apply them to the plant, and it is transported down into the roots and other parts of the plant, so that uh, in small to medium-sized plants, it will often, it will usually kill the whole plant. And so most of the herbicides that are used, uh, except for these organic products, are systemic herbicides. Uh, for insecticides, there also is that concept of contact versus systemic. Uh, for uh, most of the insecticides that we use are actually contact uh, insecticides. So you need to, uh, the, the, the bug needs to uh, contact the uh, insecticide specifically. So you have to get good coverage on the leaves if the if the uh, insect is feeding on the underside of the leaf and you just treat the upper side, it's possible that the insect won't, won't be um, uh, affected. So good coverage is required. Systemic uh, insecticides are ones that you can apply to the soil and they will be taken up in the roots into the leaves and other parts of the plant. So imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid and a very, now very common, in fact I think it's the most common insecticide used in the world, and certainly now about the most common insecticide used in California gardens, and it's one of the most uh, promoted one, this bare advanced um, uh, uh, insect and drug control is, is one brand, but there's other brands of imidacloprid too. 
Uh, so this was hailed when they, these first came out as a really great insecticide because you were just treating the roots and it didn't get on the leaves and you didn't get drift of the pesticide blowing around in the neighborhood and uh, was thought that things that landed on the leaves <coughs> beneficials wouldn't be impacted. But recently it's been shown that uh, this, uh, these, the systemic will get into the flowers. <laughs> so if you have a flowering uh, bush or tree, uh, it'll get into the nectar, and so any beneficial insects or bees feeding on the nectar can be injured. Um, and so really we're trying to get people to pull back from using these products. Uh, they're also quite toxic to earthworms. And of course, if you're applying them to the soil, that's, a, that's an issue. So, the imidacloprid, but, so, but it's a systemic insecticide. So, when you're talking about toxicity, all, all pesticides are toxic. That's their whole point, is they've got to be toxic to something because you're trying to control something. Um, so, they, it's, it's the ability of a pesticide to injure an organism, and, and all pesticides are toxic to something. Um, but the selective pesticides are often toxic just to a few closely related organisms, so it makes them safer to use in the environment. The other thing about uh, toxicity is the dose makes the poison, so um, in any case, the, the higher rate you're using, the more toxic it will be. Um, the less toxic uh, pesticides require higher doses to be. Uh, broadly toxic. And then, of course, when you're applying pesticides, you have to remember that even though you may not see it happening, pesticides always move in the environment despite even your best efforts to uh, avoid it. They will drift in the air. Um, when you apply pesticides um, to a plant and then uh, that will leave residues on the plant or the soil and then uh, 12 or 24 hours later when the sprinklers go on, it can wash off and go into the storm drains and get into our water systems. So pesticides, you, it, it's impossible to keep them entirely where you want them. And so you will, that's one reason why we want to use selective materials that have less impact on uh, wildlife and beneficials. No, the pesticide label is a really important document. You all have sort of a little copy of a pesticide uh, label there just to, to look at with the, the features of it. The pesticide label has information on the brand and the product, the active ingredient, which is really important, the active ingredient. So the product and brand identification is that the big letters um, that uh, they're using to market their product. Sluggo, big letters. The active ingredient is the toxic material that does the killing. And that's the really important thing for you to know. Uh, because there's a lot of brands for most of these active ingredients. But um, the uh, the active ingredient is another reason why you need your hand lens. Is my microphone still working? Yeah. I think so. So the hand lens, because the active ingredient is such a small little piece on your, your um, product there. Uh, there'll be directions for use, precautionary statements, first aid instructions, note to physicians. If you or somebody else does get poisoned by a, a pesticide or swallows some or gets exposed, bring the product label or the product container to the doctor's office with you. So the doctor will know what you're dealing with. So there's important information on the label. Not everything you need to know, but lots of good things. <laughs> so yeah, this is one of the most important things to learn in this whole in this whole section is this idea of not confusing 
the, the trade name and the acronym reading name. So here we go. We've got Weed Be Gone. And that is the trade name. And then here, when you get your hand lens out, and this is a different product, the active ingredient is a very small type here. Usually it's 1% uh, uh, or less of the product. But it is the important thing. If you want to look up information on the safety of a, a material, of a product, or whether it's effective against a specific pest, or whether it's phytotoxic to your plant, the trade name isn't going to do you much good. You, you need to have the active ingredient name to do that, to talk about it. So trade names, one thing I've found through time is the manufacturers will, will get a trade name they really like, and um, sometimes they'll use that uh, uh, on different <coughs> active ingredients over the years. Um, sometimes the trade name will be almost exactly the same, but they'll have different active ingredients. So um, it, it's Good for marketing, but not good for understanding your pesticide. Uh, other things on the label, there's the signal word. This is the caution word here. Gives you a very broad idea of uh, how poisonous this product is. Um, the EPA <coughs> registration number is um, it's here on the label. that indicates it's been registered by the US Environmental uh, Protection Agency. <coughs> Uh, so the signal words, and here's a danger signal word, uh, the signal words are uh, the most toxic materials are danger, poison, and danger. There's almost, there's very few uh, home use products that are in the danger category. One of them is an organic product uh, that uh, is, a, is acetic acid, which is a weed killer. So, only one I know right now. Lime sulfur is no longer a uh, home use product. It used to be when we made this slide. Uh, most of the products you'll find on your, on your um, uh, shelves for the retail gardens that are a caution. There's a few warning ones. So for warning, one <coughs> teaspoon to an ounce will kill you. Uh, <laughs> caution, one ounce to relatively non-toxic will kill you. So uh, the thing that bothers me, why I find the single words not very useful, is because all, most of the products are caution, but there's a big range between one ounce will kill you and relatively non-toxic. I mean, you could imagine your kid or somebody actually, or your dog, getting, getting uh, swallowing one ounce of a product, perhaps. Um, and so you'd, but you know, so you'd probably maybe want to stay on the relatively non-toxic end of it. But um, the, 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 these single words don't help. Now, and the other thing that with the single words is that uh, now they've actually started phasing out uh, the single word on. There's very, there's few, very low toxicity pesticides that don't have a single word at all, not even caution. And I think there's a few products here on the on these containers that you'll be looking at later that don't have a signal word. Um, and that generally means that, that means that they are probably in that relatively non-toxic category. So directions for use, again, this is another place where you may need your hand lens. Um, it tells you how to mix up the product. It's really important to follow the directions. A lot of people don't follow the directions properly. If the pest, if you mix it up to, uh, so the rate is, uh, uh, too high, you put too much pesticide in the tank, you could not only injure yourself or something, you could, it could be phytotoxic to the plant. If you do too low a dose, underrate, then it probably won't be effective against the pest. In general, I think for a lot of people, the best thing to do is to buy the, the ready-use squirt bottle uh, containers. Uh, they, may be they may be a little more expensive, but this is usually all you need to know. The problem with getting uh, the concentrates is that's more pesticide than you're probably going to use in your whole life. I mean, a lot of times you're just buying pesticide to control one little tiny plant, um, and what will you do with the rest? So these less concentrated ones mean you don't have to mix it up. It'll be the right rate. But in any case, and when you mix up pesticides, you need to wear uh, proper equipment, goggles, gloves, long sleeve, everything. Uh, but you should also wear uh, something over your eyes and um, long sleeves and closed-toed shoes and 
probably gloves that don't allow, don't absorb liquid um, with even uh, these types of materials, even with uh, safe materials or safer materials. The label will also tell you what plants or sites you can use it on. And this is very important. You need to check the label and make sure that the type of plant or situation that you are want to treat is on the label. Because uh, it might be, the active ingredient might be okay, but it might be the wrong formulation. Uh, and so then you'll need another product with a different, act, with the same active ingredient. So for instance, there are pesticides that are labeled only for use on ornamentals, not for fruits and vegetables. So why might that be? Because you don't want to leave residues, food residues on them. So you don't want to use those. There's some pesticides that are labeled for indoor use, but not outdoor use, and vice versa. So always check. There are often, um, and it's a particular concern with herbicides, but also with some insecticides and fungicides. Some pesticides have phytotoxic uh, impacts. It means they injure the plants, so they will injure certain ornamental plants, and so uh, and so you don't want to use those uh, pesticides on those plants. You want to read the label uh, for that. The the labels will tell you what pests they it controls, and um, so there's be the broad range like herbicides for weeds, but um, generally it'll maybe tell you broadly weeds or, or um, grassy weeds or both. Uh, and with insecticides, often you'll see a list that's like 100 different insects on it. That's a, not a very select, it's a broad spectrum of material generally. But they are very generous with themselves when they make up the lists of what it controls, especially for the insecticides. Um, because just because the pest is on the label doesn't mean that product is the best thing to use to control the pest because it might just control 70% or something and then also it might not be the least toxic product for that situation so uh, while I would never use um, almost never use a pesticide that didn't have the pest on the label to find out what pesticide to use go to the pest notes or some other University of California source. Don't use the label as uh, your first uh, first choice for uh, how to find out which pesticide is best. A lot of times you'll look and you'll look at some of these labels they'll have it. They'll have pictures of earwigs or um, cutworms or the ugliest bugs they can think of and they just plaster it on the label. And of course that makes people buy those products because that's the thing that's bothering them, but even having the picture of the earwig on the label doesn't mean it's the best product for earwigs. <laughs> Nobody's regulating that, and then there'll be some special restrictions. So. Okay, um, pesticides, um, uh, most of the pesticides are registered by the United States EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, that's our, our big pesticide registration agency. But the state of California also registers pesticides, um, only those that are already registered by the US EPA, um, because California has stricter regulations <coughs> than US EPA on pesticides. So you need to have products that are registered in both states. Now, you can't tell by the label if it's registered in California. Uh, you can tell if it's registered by the EPA, by the EP, EPA registration number. But Presumably, pesticides that are sold in stores in California are registered in California. But if you mail order pesticides, sometimes you'll get products that aren't, although they're not supposed to. And it used to be everything was registered by the US EPA and California Department of Regulation. Over the last 10 years or so, they've, they've got this, uh, a lot of uh, new products that are food or natural oil products that are exempt from registration because they're actually food grade materials. And they call these 25 Bs and it's made it pretty confusing, but uh, you'll have, there's a number of 25 Bs here. They usually have things like rosemary oil or clove oil or garlic or um, things like that that you could imagine putting on your salad. Um, and these are, they are not registered pesticides, uh, but they're 
uh, they, they look like pesticide products and then of course they are used to uh, suppress uh, pests of all kinds. We don't know a whole lot about the efficacy of some of these products, but I think they do have short, <coughs> short term, at least, efficacy on uh, some of our pests. Another term that you come across is organically acceptable pesticides. Uh, a lot of people are interested in only using organic products in their gardens. And of course, there's farmers who uh, grow organic, and so you have to um, be very careful about not using materials that are not acceptable for organically grown produce, especially if you're selling as certified organic. Um, generally, the materials that are allowed on organic food are things that come from natural sources like plants uh, or minerals, but they can't be chemically processed. Uh, and then there are a few um, minerals and, and plant products that are not allowed, things like Strychnine and um, uh, <laughs> strychnine was an organically acceptable material for quite a while. <coughs> Nicotine, uh, sulfate, they were organically acceptable materials uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I have, you have a handout here uh, that's some organically acceptable pesticides used in gardens and landscapes, and you can use this as a uh, a resource for yourself where we tried to identify uh, uh, most of the products that are organically acceptable. Oils, uh, oils and soaps are organically acceptable, although maybe only the, um, the insecticidal, so, ins insecticidal soaps that are allowed on produce, not the weed soaps. It's all very confusing. And then, now in order to determine whether it's organically acceptable, a lot of these products will have the OMRI um, logo on it, and that means organically acceptable. <coughs> Some, this is a, comes from like a, a certification agency where the company has to pay money to them to get the certification. Mm -hmm. So some of them won't have OMRI uh, certification on them, even though they might be organic, like certain kinds of oils, for instance. Some of the, these products will say, for use in organic gardens. And in general, I would accept those as, as a, uh, generally that they would be truly organic materials. And then there's this term, less toxic pesticides. And uh, you'll see that um, used by us in the university and other people, and it's, it's not an official term, it's not in regulation, um, but it's just materials that are less toxic and ones that we're trying to encourage people to use if they have to use pesticides. Most of them are organic, uh, but there are maybe a few that aren't organically acceptable. You have a card on less toxic insecticides here. Um, that gives you a little bit of information on those too. Uh, what are some of the less toxic uh, insecticides? Uh, insecticidal soaps, uh, oils, uh, including oils that come from petroleum base and oils come from plant bases like neem and Bt. Um, the oils and soaps are for aphids, white flies, uh, and other soft-bodied insects and mites. And in BT, there's a caterpillar version and a uh, mosquito and um, uh, fungus net uh, version. So soaps and oils are really one of the main types of insecticides that we would suggest that oh, it's and soaps and oils are uh, really a key insecticide. Um, it's going to be your first choice for any of these kinds of uh, pests because of its, you know, it's fairly environmentally <laughs> benign. Uh, so aphids, scales, thrips, <coughs> lace bugs, spider mites, psyllids. Um, oils um, and soaps, but particularly oils, are also effective against uh, a number of foliar diseases caused by fungi. So they're very useful. And this is soap versus oils. So what's the difference between soaps and oils? Um, often we sort of talk about them uh, together, but they are, um, uh, uh, they, they both disrupt uh, respiration. Oil sort of smother the pests. Uh, soap, actually, the mode of action isn't completely clear, but they, 
they disrupt respiratory, uh, but they also probably have some impact within cell membranes. Uh, but the important thing is they both need to, they both require uh, good coverage. So the, the insect has to be completely covered uh, by the oil or the soap. So that if you leave a residue on the, if there's a residue left on the leaf and the insect comes a few hours later, it probably will not be killed. That's, so good coverage is very important. Oils are used uh, particularly for woody plants, um, larger plants, uh, soaps for smaller plants and vegetables, but neem oils are used also uh, in, in gardens too. How long do you leave it on? Well, insecticidal well, oils, well, you, you, you apply it. Yeah, and apply it, and sometimes if the ins insects come back, you may have to reapply, because they don't leave any toxic residue. So insects uh, coming back or coming in another day later are not going to be killed. But the benefit of that is beneficials coming in a day later aren't going to be killed either. But you have to remember with, um, in many cases, you don't need to kill 100% of your aphids. You just need to reduce the numbers low enough so that maybe the natural enemies can take care of them. Um, yeah, there's that. Do you have a question there? Um, yeah, I'm concerned because I have jasmine. I, I think this is probably a question that a lot of people have. I'm worried about bees. Uh -huh. And um, I've been told neem oil is toxic to bees. So wh what are you treating your jasmine for? It's got scales all over it. Mm -hmm. um, and so does my passion fruit. It's got mm -hmm. scale insects. Mm -hmm. and things yeah. I don't even know how to diagnose yet. Well, the thing to do is to... Uh, um, you, you need to apply it when, the, when they're not flowering, if possible, because they're not going to impact the bees if the plants aren't flowering. Um, oils and soaps are less toxic to bees, but you wouldn't want to apply them uh, when the bees are flying in the, in the middle of the day. But if you apply it when, especially in something like oils or soaps that have no resi re residual toxicity, aren't going to impact bees are beneficial, or bees when, um, I should say bees when the flowers aren't blue because the bees won't be there. Um, but uh, <coughs> you might want to find out whether you've got, uh, I don't know what kind of s scales are on there, but you know, the, for a lot of the scale insects, there are natural enemies out there, parasites, and um, uh, it would be good to try to hold back and, and see whether there's parasites in there, because you, when you kill off the scales, you could also be impacting your biological control, too. Again, even for oils and soaps, you know, you shouldn't be out there treating all the time. I mean, this is really, uh, you know, for major kinds of problems. Um, okay, I'll take that one one question. I'm not going to take a whole lot of questions, otherwise I'll run out of time. Okay. Yeah. Is there a shelf life for the soaps and the oils and insecticides in general? Well, that's a good question. Is there a shelf life for insects? And um, there is no specific shelf life. Uh, they don't, uh, no specific shelf life, but I would truly, I would not recommend keeping them more than two or three years. Um, things can deteriorate or have chemical reactions. That's one reason why you never want to buy more than you think you can use in a season which sometimes is impossible because the containers are so big you can't, you can't get a little, but maybe you can share it with your neighbor or something. But the best thing is, is not to store pesticides uh, any longer than a, a couple of years um, for, for many reasons. And, and of course, different chemicals are going to degrade faster than other chemicals, so it's hard to generalize. Uh, particularly the biologicals, I would be careful about those too. Okay, and so then another question that comes up is this uh, issue with uh, uh, petroleum versus plant oils. A lot of people don't like petroleum because they think about the oil spills and all the, the birds on the beach and all that kind of stuff. But you have to remember that the oils that you're using as insecticides are like, oh, they're, they're, they're very highly, uh, very highly refined. They're very similar to like the baby oil you might put on your baby's bottom. And they're used at usually 1% in water. And so you can cover the eggshells all you want with that. It's not going to impact them. It's a very, very
very light solution, sometimes 2%, but usually 1 or 2% oil and water. So um, they don't, um, the petroleum oil is, is very benign in the environment. Uh, but the plant-based oils, neem oil is one of the most popular. It probably, they, they work the same way in terms of smothering the insects and the respiratory impact. Neem oil has a little bit of an insect growth regulator in it, perhaps, that may add another little pizzazz to it. Um, uh, both have uh, fungicidal activity. Okay, here's a list of the uh, plant essential oils. So these are the ones that are uh, considered food grade products and they aren't actually registered by the, uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. They're 25B products. And so you can see examples of cinnamon, citric acid, citronella, clove, cod seed. All of these are things that could be in food products. Um, they can be effective on um, soft-bodied insects and mites. Um, they may work a little bit like oils do, uh, but they may also have a repelling action um, and other types of modes of action we just really don't know. But they're going to have a very short, short residual, so they're just going to probably kill insects just on impact. They won't leave a toxic residue for other insects coming in. And you, you'll, you won't see a lot of recommendations for these types of products in our pest notes because people just haven't done the research on them. And then people say, well, why haven't you done the research on them? It's because there's nobody to do the research. <laughs> Although some of these are used in agriculture, and like cinnamon, and uh, so we do have a little bit of information there. Uh, the microbial in, uh, insecticides, again, these we've talked about these before. They're derived from insect pathogens, so they naturally uh, derived. The most uh, widely known is the Bacillus thuringiensis for stocky for the caterpillars. Um, again, the caterpillar has to eat it. It has to get into their gut. Um, it's most effective against small caterpillars. It'll break down rapidly, so you have to reapply it every... Um, so you, what you want to do is apply it just as the eggs of the caterpillars are hatching. If more hatch out a week later, you may have to apply it again because it certainly will have broken down by then. But it's very non-toxic. There is another microbial, the um, Cydia pavanella granulosis, which is a granulosis virus, Cydex, which is uh, effective against the codling moth, and it's a very good product for the codling moth. And then again, the Israelizensis is the, uh, the form of Bt that's effective against mosquitoes and fungus gnats. Other lower toxicity pesticides, spinosad. Spinosad is a, uh, it's derived, so it's a microbial, it's derived from a soil, uh, a soil uh, microorganism. Uh, I think it was found in a, some rum factory in some Caribbean island or something. <laughs> uh, and uh, it has a strange heritage, but um, it's a natural fermentation product, I guess, but it, it, um, it's, it's broadly, so it's organic because it's natural, uh, but it's more broadly toxic against a lot of different insects, so that's why um, it's classified as more broadly toxic than BT, the BTs, which are very specific for either caterpillars or flies. Uh, but it is very useful for some of those pests where the B, where the other safer materials don't work, and it's um, so one of them is the spot, spotted wing Drosophila on cherries. Do you have that down here? Yes, spotted wing Drosophila on, on cherries. Really nasty insect, uh, very hard to uh, control. Uh, it is also effective against codling moth, which is difficult to control. It's the safest material for that, other than the granulosis virus, which is hard to get. The spinosad is. Um, readily available in the, um, in the stores. This Monterey Garden Insect Spray is spinosad. It's a very common product, but there'll be other brands too. And then uh, the, the botanicals, uh, the main botanicals we have now are pyrethrum from the chrysanthemum <coughs> daisy and azadirectin, which is <coughs> extracted from the neem seed. So the neem seed, we get the oil from it, and then the azadiractin is actually an extract of another chemical that comes out of the neem seed. They're actually two different 
uh, products that come out of the same neem seed. The neem, neem is a tree from India that has these wonderful qualities to it. Um, uh, again, both of these are more broadly toxic, but they break down very rapidly in the environment. So that's why they're more compatible with natural enemies and not, not that toxic to uh, wildlife or people. <coughs> ant baits. So here's uh, just some pictures of the ant baits. And usually most of the ant baits that we recommend right now for Argentine ant is uh, liquid borate uh, or boric acid and it's, um, it's a fairly uh, safe material to use, um, a non, uh, less toxic type of material. Uh, but uh, ant baits, because they are in containers, uh, that also makes them a little bit safer because they don't get out into the environment like something you're, you're spraying, so they're containerized. So the common uh, insecticide products that uh, are, do not qualify as less toxic are <coughs> organophosphates. And these include malathion, acephate, disulfotan actually is not on the, I think it's off the home use market now. So malathion and acephate are the main ones that are, and malathion is probably by far the more widely used one. So these are, these are being phased out. There used to be lots of them. They used, the organophosphates used to be the main products back in the 1980s that people used in their gardens. Carbaryl is still there. Seven is the main trade name for carbaryl. Uh, very, very toxic to bees uh, and, and uh, beneficial, particularly parasitic wasps. Um, and then the pyrethroids. And these pyrethroids, uh, they mimic the, the mode of action of the pyrethra, the, the botanical that comes from the uh, chrysanthemum daisy, but they're synthesized and it lasts much longer and it's much toxic, uh, much more toxic. Uh, and as a result, um, they are they are very they're hard in the environment because they persist for a long time. They will make spider mites flare up. They will kill bees. They will kill fish. Um, they are uh, not that toxic to people, but uh, they have bad environmental effects. So you want to avoid using these in your garden. Uh, as much as you can. Most of them have this RIN at the end. There's a lot of different products. Pyrethrin, permethrin, cyfluthrin, cypermethrin, the esmethalerate, we've got to have it. Uh, but all these products are ones that you want to mostly try to avoid. And then there's the neonicotinoids, and these include the imidacloprid, that's systemic, these are systemics. Imidacloprid, dinotifurin, and a few other products um, that are used as systemics. And here is a uh, little chart. Looks much prettier here. <laughs> much more readable too. But again, this is a repeat um, uh, of the same information. The, the, the green, the green stripes are the, the ones that you want to try to primarily, if you have to use insecticides, use, which is the Bacillus thuringiensis of oils and soaps um, for uh, the pests that are not um, caterpillars or, or soft-bodied insects, um, the botanicals and, and particularly spinosad are, are uh, better choices, are, are the best choices that are because they are effective. Uh, and then the ones in red we're going to try to avoid wherever possible. Uh, there's the two categories here are contact toxicity and persistence of residue. So this means, what is the broad range of um, insects that are going to be killed, and how long do they persist in the environment? So as you see, the difference between the oils and soaps is that the oils and soaps will kill a little wasps and other beneficials if they get on covered with them, but there's no residue, uh, toxic residue left in the leaf, and that's sort of what makes it a little different from spinosad, which will leave residues on the leaf for at least a few days. Uh, this is the same chart really uh, emphasizing bees um, and uh, basically the same products or uh, problems for bees. Iron phosphate, snail and slug bait. So this is, uh, we've got our sluggo over there. Um, iron phosphate is, um, if you have to use baits for snails and slugs, but snails and slugs are 
a pest that you need to, you really need an, you need an IPM program. It's a pest where you really need to integrate different control methods uh, to effectively uh, control them. Baits alone generally will not satisfactorily control snails and slugs. You have to do a combination of modifying the habitat. Um, uh, you can do trapping, can be very effective. Um, you can grow plants that snails and slugs don't like. Uh, and uh, in the habitat, what are some of the things you would do in a habitat to deter uh, snails and slugs? You don't give them a place to hide. Yeah, get rid of the hiding places. What what do they what do they really like? Damp. Damp, right. The snails and slugs that are pests in most of California, they are Europeans. Um, they come from what they like is they like you know, they like a nice English or French environment rainfall uh, in the summertime and those nice green fresh plants. Um, they, they can't, they don't really like the dry summer. So if you're just growing native plants and you don't water them, you're not going to have snail and slug problems. Because the snails and slugs, you know, they travel on that mucus foot there and they can't travel very far over dry soil. They, they need a damp surface to get very far. And so when you are constantly keeping a watering, sprinkling a garden, you are really providing them with a wonderful, well, you're extending their transportation uh, potential there by slithering over these, these wet areas. And so um, that is very important. Trapping, somebody mentioned beer, uh, and beer traps are available, and they're really great for people who like to drink beer because you have to put a lot of them out, and you have to keep the beer filled there, and there's always a little left in the bottle. Um, if, they, if they dry up, the snails and slugs, if they if they dry up soon enough, they'll they'll just get over their hangover and <laughs> slug off. <laughs> so uh, I I like the kind of uh, we we have board traps and um, they and you just put them down and then you pick them up and then you squash those snails and slugs or feed them to your ducks or um, put them in a bag plastic bag or something. Um, that's another. One. But anyway. I have a question. Uh -huh. Diatomaceous earth is moderately toxic. To bees. Big bees. Bees. If, if it gets on them. Yeah, if it gets on them. Uh, yeah, that's what the. Uh, I got the, the chart from the, uh, the bee hazard uh, group, and or Oregon has a, a publication which is linked to the UCIPM webpage that provides information on toxicity. Can you say something about the spinosad? Uh, spinosad um, here. On so the next, next slide. Uh, Oops, it's going back. You, you talking about um, that's added to slug? What, what, what did you? Oh, the spinosad. Oh, yeah, okay, spinosad added to slug. Oh, right. It's one of the things I, yeah, I don't like. So, what? so, um, yeah. So, take a look at your sluggo products because now they're adding spinosad to some of these products. Usually that says something, uh, sluggo plus or something, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. and, and in the active ingredient, they also are adding the spinosad to it, and they say it's for earwigs. Spinosad won't do anything for slugs and snails. Um, and, you know, if you have earwig problems, I'm not sure that the spinosad will work very well anyway, but if you do, you should do something separate for them. It's the sow bugs. The sow bugs you don't need to control. They eat my strawberry. No! This, I'm glad you brought They don't eat your strawberries. They are there holding the bag in the morning. You get up too late. The thing that the thing that ate your strawberries was the snail and the slugs. And then they went off and hid. And in the morning, the sow bugs come in. Because what the sow bugs like to eat is they like to eat something that's already been exposed and opened up by um, the, the, uh, the slugs and snails, or maybe the earwigs. Um, and so the sow bugs are, what they are, they like to eat uh, decomposing matter. So usually they are not the first culprits. They're just there taking the blame. <laughs> so usually it's something else. But sow bugs are the same thing as that you need to get rid of the habitat that favors them. You might, must have a lot of cover and wet places where they can hide. But what damage do they do? 
What? They don't do much damage, do they? No, well, they, they don't, but, but what happens is they do show up in things like your strawberries, but they, usually the strawberries have already been damaged by something else, and they're there just eating the decomposing strawberry, but they look like they did the problem. So, so the... Um, Metallohyde, though, I want to make a point about this metallohyde. For a long time, it was the primary bait product that we had for home gardens was metallohyde. And this, so if you see this in the active ingredient, avoid those products because metallohyde is very toxic to dogs, it's toxic to birds and people, and, and this uh, iron uh, phosphate is, is uh, much, um, much uh, safer and just as, pretty much just as effective. There are some, there's some new products with this ferret. EDTA appearing on the shelves and don't really know very much about uh, its effectiveness. I do know it's not organically acceptable and iron phosphate is. Okay. Uh, just, I can ask you. Yeah. Let me, I, I, I want to go through this because I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time for our little exercise. So, um, herbicides. So, there's also herbicides that are used in organic systems. Most, uh, a lot of those 25B oils, um, uh, herbicidal soap, although I, I have to check into this because herbicidal soaps may not actually be organically acceptable. I think they are acceptable for <laughs> ornamentals but not for vegetables. Vinegar. This is the danger product, 20% uh, vinegar. I mean, that is very caustic and you can really burn yourself and because of your eyes, you're in big trouble. It's the only. Uh, home and land, home use product that's got danger on it. You don't see it very often. It's called farm um, wheat farm. Right? Um, so all of these plants, they're they're contact herbicides. They uh, only burn back uh, plants. They make kill really young plants, mostly broadleaves. They're not effective against perennials. Uh, they're non-selective, so if they get on your uh, your, your desirable plants, they may burn them as well. They could be useful for cracks and crevices, um, and the acetic acid can be dangerous. So those are some types of things. Um, uh, for fungicides, uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, for powdery mildew and black spot on roses, the best fungicide is actually um, neem and other kinds of oils um, that are, that you'll see them labeled for this use. And that's one of the things that you want to, you hear about soaps, you hear about oils, you hear about diatomaceous earth, you hear about other things that are, you, you might say, well, can I use my, my soap, my dishwashing liquid soap? Uh, well, maybe you could, but as a master gardener, you do not ever suggest that uh, because you need to suggest only products that are registered as pesticides and labeled as pesticides. Also, if you buy a insecticidal or fungicidal soap, um, you know that it is appropriate and it's mixed up at the, the, the right rate. And a lot of these products have, well, they have these inner ingredients, but, some, but those will maybe be uh, things that make it spread better on the leaf than if you mixed up your own. So um, we aren't mixing up our own fungicides. There are some bio biologicals like Bacillus subtilis, sodium bicarbonate. Um, okay, so. Here is the pest, a pest note. You saw this pest note in my earlier talk, but as an example of, I wanted you to um, remember, if you want to find information on toxicity of the pesticides that are discussed in the pest notes, you can use this compare risk button, and when you click on it, what you will get is you will get a table like this, which lists all the, and this is for powdery mildew and ornamentals, lists all the, uh, the pesticides that were suggested in the <coughs> pest note, this is not all the pesticides that are registered. One thing about the pest notes, it only lists pesticides that the authors feel are appropriate for use, and a lot of times it's really mostly they're focusing on less toxic types of pesticides. So there'll be pesticides that are registered for the use that aren't listed here. 
And that's because the author felt that they were either not effective or not appropriate in an integrated pest management program. Um, and so you can see for each of these products, uh, there's water quality rating, uh, this is uh, impact on beneficial insects uh, rating. Uh, so the red ones are bad, the blue ones are, uh, or white ones are no concern, moderate is sort of this uh, gold color. Honeybees, acute toxicity to people and mammals, and long term toxicity. This is means whether it shows up either on the California <coughs> Proposition 65 list or the um, US EPA list. Scott helped put this database together a long, long time ago. <laughs> Early, long time ago. That was a little project we had. Scott's done a lot of stuff. Like he, he was, the, he was the mover and shaker uh, uh, behind this kiosk too. That was that was Scott's idea. Uh, it's really been, it's really been an incredible. state used it, but it started right here in San Diego. And here's some uh, resources of information on um, pesticides. This National Pesticide Information Center is a really good place. They have, you can print out, they've got little fact sheets on home use products, and so if somebody you know, wants information on home use products, they will probably have a fact sheet or active ingredients that you could just print out and send them or, or link them to. It's very good. And of course, the UCI website has information, uh, but I particularly <coughs> recommend, um, recommend uh, that. And uh, again, this, this uh, presentation is on the website there, so you can use it.